Okay. Please welcome David Rubenstein, co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlisle Group, to facilitate a conversation with White House Infrastructure Coordinator and Special Advisor to the President, Mitch Landrieu. Good morning. I don't know. I mean, Ratner had charts. Did you see those charts? They were well, we don't have uh, anything fancy like charts. that. We just have us. But tell me, Good when uh, when are we going to get infrastructure improvements in the United States? When will I be able to see them? <laughs> well, if you walk out this door, you can see it right now. Really? Absolutely. We're digging up pipes and fixing what about when pipes I, right down the street. When I drive, but in, not in front of your house, though. You can't do like a house call. Well, what about if I'm like driving in from uh, Dulles? There, my cell phone calls are dropping still. When are you going to fix that problem? Today, I'll fix that this afternoon. He's like my mother. So, I was, when, I, when, I was, when I was mayor of the city of New Orleans and I was fixing roads, my mother would complain that the street in front of a house wasn't as good as she wanted it to be. And I'm like, I'm going to get to it. So then right when I was leaving office, we got to it. And the problem was it, was it was making it hard for her to get to the doctor fast. And so then she complained because it was too much construction. And I said, Mom, you can't have it both ways. And she says, I'm your mother. I can have it however I want. And when you were Not that I'm comparing to saying you look like my mother. When I'm you were saying. growing up in New Orleans, I, you, you had how many brothers and sisters? Eight. Eight. The nine of us. Landers are like roaches. Nine. Okay. And have you failed by only having five children? Yes. Yes. My wife and I have five children, and my mother scolded me the other day. Uh, my mother, who's 90 years old now, who scolded me the other day for not keeping up. Between us, by the way, we have 38. I have eight brothers and sisters. We have 38 kids together and she has 16 great grandkids. So, I mean, I really meant it. We're really like roaches. It's a problem. So um, when did you, somebody call you and say, we'd like you to take on <laughs> this infrastructure? What were you doing at the time? Seven days before November 15th, a year and a half ago, I was, um, I was going fishing. True, true, this is a true story. My brother had just bought a Nautica boat, 24 feet. We were going out into the marsh to catch speckled trout and my phone rang and it was Brian Deese who, I had, who I, I had known a little bit before. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going fishing. He said, I heard you know a little bit about rebuilding stuff. I said, a little bit. He says, well, tell me about you know, what went on when the city was destroyed by Katrina and you work with the federal government to reconstruct the schools and the libraries. And I chit-chatted with him for a little bit. And he said, well, listen, you know, the president might want to talk to you about this. Would you, be, would you be willing to talk to the president? And I said, well, sure, Brian. If the president called me, I'd be happy to talk to him. He, so he called me the next day and said, the president wants you to come up here and, and do this thing. That, that's what he said. And I said, what thing? And he said, the infrastructure bill that we just passed. I said, wow, that's an incredible honor. I would consider it. When do you want me to come? He says, Monday. I said, which Monday? He said, next Monday. We would like you to be up here. And as all you recall, the president signed the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, on November 15th. And right. that's the day that I came and started 16 months and ago. And where's your office? My office is in the EEOB in room 150. And who reports to you? You have staff? How does that work? I have, a, I have staff, and uh, I'm a senior advisor to the president, and uh, I report to the president through the chief of staff, and then I have a group of folks that try to help me do when, my work. When the infrastructure bill was passed, was it an authorization bill or an appropriation bill? Uh, it was both. Both. So both. all the money's appropriated? A lot of the... No, most of the money is appropriated and it will continue to be over time. Okay, so how many projects are now underway under the infrastructure it's bill? An excellent question. How are you guys doing? We have 25,000 projects uh, in process right now across the country. So let me give you the, the 50,000 foot view. Uh, $1.2 trillion investments in roads, bridges, airports, ports, waterways, high speed internet everywhere in the country a subsidy program that connects people to the internet where there is high speed internet but they can't afford it, clean air, safe water, let me stop on that for a second, cleaning up super funds, brownfield sites, orphan wells, abandoned mine lands, and then pushing money into the clean energy uh, economy, which of course was laid on top of by the Inflation Reduction Act, both of these things. Remember when the bill was passed, there had been some consternation when the president got here about having one bill and then they separated it all, and then they started eating the elephant one bite at a time, and, and the infrastructure law was the first one. Everybody said that's all Biden's ever going to get done. He's too old. He can't get anything done. He can't bring people together. And then, lo and behold, in fairly short order, they passed the CHIPS bill, they passed the Inflation Reduction Act bill, and a whole host of other bills that have now formed the basis of the president's Invest in America agenda, which is essentially 
if you invest in the people of America and in the things of America, you will grow the economy and incent the private sector to invest, which, by the way, uh, the private sector has done to the tune of $435 billion in just the last couple so, of months. Um, many of these infrastructure projects are under the jurisdiction of various uh, cabinet departments, yep. I assume. So if you're working at the White House, how do you relate to the cabinet officers? It's tell a, them what to do or they tell you what to do? Well, we have a great partnership. So let me just, my team is basically charged by the president with doing uh, one thing, which is hurrying the hell up and get the projects coming out of the ground colloquially, but essentially the organizational structure is three things. One, build the team. Two, get the money out the door. Three, tell the story. So let me take you through build the team first. You make an excellent point, and one of the reasons why I think the president brought me up here was because in order to, re you may recall Katrina. I don't know if you remember Katrina, Rita, Ike, Gustav, the National Recession, and the BP oil spill. Those are the, all the things that happened to the New Orleans area where I lived. And essentially, when I took over, the city was bankrupt. Literally, every building was had been underwater for 17 feet. We had to reconstruct it, and we had to do it in partnership with the federal government. So learning from those experiences... I brought that up and I, and I opined for the president in partnership with Sean Donovan, who, by the way, was secretary of head and OMB director under Obama, that the way it worked was to build a team of people that forced the federal government, the state governments, the local governments to have horizontal and vertical integration. Um, they had to be talking to everybody every day. And so the way that kind of scopes out on a day to day basis in, in its essence is that all the cabinet secretaries have to meet on a continual basis. So I've hosted 16 cabinet meetings that are all on the task force. There are 14 agencies. We're constantly working and talking with each other so that when you come see the federal government, it's a one-stop shop view. So for example, when you're laying down 500,000 electrical vehicle charging stations, that's a partnership between the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation. So it's cohesive. When you're talking about laying high-speed internet, that's the FCC, that's agriculture, that's Department of Commerce. They all have to be communicating, walking, and my job is to help do that. However, if you just get that part done, that's a, that's a monumental task, even in Washington, for people that generally don't even like talking to each other. But what you then have to do is make sure they're working with the states, because this money gets down to the ground two ways. Um, it goes through formula funding that had been set up since Ronald Reagan was in office because they thought the states were the laboratories of democracy. So we just plussed up that money, for example, the highway fund or the water funds. And then the second way you get money is through people asking for grants. And those can be states and those can be cities. And so in order to make that work, I had to talk to every one of the governors in the country and ask them to appoint an infrastructure coordinator. And then I had to talk to all the mayors. And that's the when you say build a team, that's the entire team that has to be kept in formation to get these projects, to get the money down to the ground and then to get the project so coming out underneath. Them. The authorization was one point two trillion. Yeah. How much of that money has actually now been expended? It's an excellent question. We have $210 billion that we have pushed out of the door because 90% of this money, I told you it's two ways to get to the ground through formula funds and then through grants, 90% of it is going to be spent by the governors and the mayors. And so through the formula funding that's been sent out and through the grant applications that have been awarded, we've pushed out $210 billion. 25,000 projects are funded in okay. 4,500 communities across the country. Of the $210 billion, would you say it's roughly proportionate to population, or is it some states have more than their population would warrant? No, we're doing a pretty, the, the president's directive was don't pay attention to politics, A, get the money to red states and the blue states, blue cities, red cities, wherever that might be. And we have actually, if you go to build, B-U-I-L-D, build.gov, there's actually a schematic of where all the projects are right now that we can, that we can show you. And if you push a little button, it'll pull the project up. So you can take a look at it, but it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good, you know, blow across the entire. What's country. the biggest project underway right now under the infrastructure? The biggest expenditure of dollars? Uh, probably the big bridges. Pro we, we, you, you may have seen the president went to uh, Kentucky and stood on the Brent Spence Bridge with uh, Speaker McConnell uh, and then Governor Bashir, and you have a bridge that's connecting two states. You got, you got two red, a red governor, a blue governor and you got the whole nine yards. That was the best right. representation. And to date, that's the largest expenditure, which if I recall right, is one of, about $1.5 billion. So any governors or mayors called the president and said that you're doing a bad job on something and they want something funded that you don't want to fund? Has that ever happened? Uh, it happens all the time. Um, so my, what does the president do? He says, Mitch, 
he calls me. And he says, what's, he says, what's going on with this? First of all, to note, I don't make the decisions about who gets and who doesn't get. The cabinet secretaries make that decision. And there's always separation between the White House um, and the cabinets for that reason, because as Congress set this up, they wanted there to be some kind of objective criteria. Uh, and so what happens is all of these projects get graded. The secretaries grade them. We all think about where the most important places are to build the stuff that you need quickly. And then the decisions are made. Now, think about this for a minute. 1.2 trillion, by the way, I don't see anybody in here as old as Eisenhower, but this is the biggest thing since then and our FDR. And, and arguably, it's bigger given the private sector investment that's blowing off of this stuff. But when we've been arguing this, remember, y'all have all been here for Infrastructure Week for the past 30 or 40 years. It didn't exist. And nobody ever put any money up. This is actually the first time that there's real money and it's actually really flowing out to do it. So that's the first thing to remember. Secondly, um, notwithstanding the debate, I know we have a little bit of amnesia in this town, but when this thing started off, people wanted a whole lot and then nobody wanted anything. And then they got in a big fight about well, what infrastructure actually was and they ended up on this $1.2 trillion figure. But if you ask anybody who's been thinking about this for a while, if you're 50 years late and everything that you have is broken, you know you need more than $1.2 trillion. So it, it stands to reason that all of these uh, programs and projects and grant applications are way oversubscribed. So for example, if there was a notice of funding opportunity that went out for a billion dollars, let's say, for bridges, we would get applications that equal 25 billion. Right. And if we were gonna award 10 to 15 projects, we would get 400 applications. And so what happens here is, is that we tell most people no. We tell about 5% of the people yes. Now, what's been an interesting forcing factor here is because this money's out there, people know it's real and the private sector is looking about where to invest. We're getting a much clearer picture of where the really critical infrastructure needs are for the country. And we'll be able, hopefully, to tell the next administration, whoever they are and whenever it gets here, that this is what investing in the future right. really looks like strategically. So consequently, we get calls all the time, as you know, from senators and congressmen who are like, my project didn't get funded. Why did that happen? And there's actually a mechanism in the bill that requires us to give them an explanation about what worked and what didn't work or why it got graded a certain way so that it will withstand public okay. scrutiny from the inspectors generals and everybody else because, and I'll end here, the president said, make sure there's no waste, fraud, and abuse. Make sure that this is transparent. Make sure okay. that this money is spent well. And that's what we're trying to do and all at once. Louisiana time. getting its fair share? <laughs> the pre yes, Louisiana is getting its fair share uh, and if, for uh, what it's entitled to. Now, if you, you ever ran for office again, would this job help you or hurt you? Uh, well, it, it depends on, on where I ran. Oh. You know, if I ran in a place that didn't get any stuff, they'd be mad at me. If I ran in a place that did, they would, they so would say, many, hey, you did a good job. I don't know. Many people in the United States, when we travel overseas and you go to nice new airports in places like Singapore, Hong Kong, and yeah. Our airports are a little run down. In fact, I don't think we built a new one I don't in know. Denver. I don't know where you've been, but LaGuardia opened up okay. the other day. I just talked to Meridian folks who built it, and it's gorgeous. You remember the president kind of gobsmacked right. him um, right, in, right in the middle of the new, the new construction. But LaGuardia is really good. We built, you may, you, you may not recall, but when I was mayor of the city of New Orleans, I built a brand new airport. You flew out of it the other day. It was nice. One, right. A $1 billion airport that was gorgeous. Um, we have made, by the way, um, the point that he's making is, is exactly correct. Uh, over time, as the president has said, we've forgotten to invest in ourselves. And all of our infrastructure is, is old and it's decaying and we're way behind. This bill is pushing us forward fast. And so just in the last year, I don't have the exact numbers right in front of me, but we have made massive investments in a lot of the airports across the okay. country, hundreds of them, and we'll continue to do that because we've got to catch up. We're way behind. The president's completely right about this. There's no reason why airports ought to take play second fiddle to anywhere else in the world. And that's the same thing that's true about high speed and the same thing that's true about high speed rail. Well, there's some catch concern up. in some communities about building um, G5 kind of uh, terminals, or, or not terminals, uh, towers. When you're, when, when you're trying to get new towers for new cell phones and so forth, a lot of people don't want them in their backyards, but they want the best new technology. Yeah. Have you heard running into that problem yet? That's not a, yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants something and nobody wants to pay for it. You know, I mean, that's just kind of, the, that's the way it is. And people say they want a new future, but we have not in my backyard stuff that we deal with all the time. And so we have, we have these resolution mechanisms that we have to go through. We, we actually butt up against ourselves from time to time. This, this president um, and this administration has a great relationship, for example, with tribal communities. 
uh, across the country. And we have, we, we believe in a nation to nation status. So we have to do a lot of consultation in the event that there's anything that's gonna go on on tribal lands. Now, some people hear that, oh, the tribal communities don't want much going on, but given the way some tribes are today, that are actually doing a little bit better, who are moving into economic development, they actually are the ones that are pushing on us saying, y'all don't permit fast enough. So we have all these cross-cutting challenges that we're trying to work through. Right. And one of the, I, this is just my observation as somebody that, um, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but if you don't live in Washington and you're not of Washington, you tend to see the world differently. You tend to, you tend to see the world from the bottom up, not the top down. So your focus is on, uh, the, the person who's living in the mobile home in Lowndes County that doesn't have indoor plumbing or the young girl named Luma who I met the other day that's living in a mobile home uh, in the Imperial Valley who's got arsenic in her water and can't get out. Right. And the president's view is how do you get stuff to them? And, and so you're looking at it from the bottom up. He's thinking about the folks that are actually working on the job that are building generational wealth right. and what's their job safety, how are they doing with their um, with their pay, how are they doing with their benefits? How are folks actually getting to work, getting to church, getting their kids to school on time? That's the way we think about it. Then we say, how do we design what's up here to get down there? What's the biggest surprise you've had in taking this job? Uh, I, I'm really, I have not been overly surprised by much because um, as you, I, had, I had been, a, as you know, a state representative for 16 years, a lieutenant governor and a mayor, and during that time, I spent a huge amount of time up here. What I continue to, to, to be, um, I guess, a little bit surprised why, why people are surprised that we're so far behind. Okay. Because if you don't, this is just real easy stuff. If you don't invest in something, it doesn't grow. If you do invest in something, it does grow. If you work on it and you practice and you have teamwork, you get better at it. And if you don't, you have dissension. And so it seems to me just, Again, I don't want to say that I'm an outsider. I've been here now for 16 months. But Washington is particularly good at arguing and not moving the ball forward. This president changed that, I mean, in a very dramatic way. Whatever your, whatever your feelings are about what his philosophy of life is, you have to say that this guy came into office and he put some real points on the board and passed some substantial legislation. And notwithstanding that Congress right now is continuing to fight about basic things like raising the debt limit, we are in the fast go execution mode on legislation that has dwarfed what has happened in the last 50 years and getting this money out, getting it down to the ground and you will see transformation. And how long did you sign up for? Do you, do you do this for a year, two I, years through I the end of the, the term? Pleasure, I serve at the pleasure of the president. Um, and you know, he could look at me tomorrow and say, I don't okay. like you anymore, I'll see you. And when you go to the Northern okay. States, do they mention your accent that it's you, hard to understand you? Well, the hard thing about, let me tell you something about, a little bit about this country, which is a problem. We have a little problem with self-identity in this sense. Like if I asked everybody in this room right now, do you think you're in the South or the North? Let's try this. How many people think they're in the North? Okay. Some people would say that we're closer to the South. So it depends. Like when I go to Texas and I ask them if they're from the South, they go, hell no, get, get out of here. Or Florida for that matter. Um, but yes, everybody has a, has a, a need to comment on my accent, um, unless I'm with Marty Walsh and I just speak a lot better than him all the time. So, and he knows that. And of all the cities in the United States, if somebody wanted to get, see the best infrastructure being built, where would that be? New Orleans, no doubt? Well, of course, New Orleans. I mean, where else would you go? And plus, we would feed you. Okay. Yeah, you know, you've been there. Right. Now, I'll, listen, let me, let me say this. This is really a very exciting thing, what's going on in the country right now, because you have um, governors and mayors who are really working hard to build things that matter, that form the foundation of building generational wealth and economic growth in their communities. And it's quite a great thing to watch. Well, I tease a lot up here about red versus blue. But when you're dealing with infrastructure, as people would say, there's no Democratic or Republican way to fill a pothole. Um, which is a cute way of saying that you just got to get the thing done. And we, but we do have to get better. There are a couple of big challenges that we have. A, this is the best opportunity that we've had in generations. B, it may never come back again because we may, we may never in this country learn the lesson of if you do something great and you build something, it actually helps us. And we may not just go, wow, that's great, let's do it again. So it's a once in a generation opportunity but, but what's beginning to happen is we have to learn how to do it better and faster, which requires communication, collaboration, and coordination on the federal, state, local levels with the private sector, the not-for-profit sector. And once we learn how to do it well, I call that the way, 
we can do a lot more of it. And, and essentially, because of the forcing function of having the money available, we are actually doing that. Two big problems that we got to, three really. One, workforce. Uh, everywhere we go in this country, everybody says we don't have enough people who are trained to do the job that is specific to this locality. Can I talk about that just for a second? So if you go into Augusta, Georgia, and a private company comes in and says because of these financial uh, dollars that the federal government's put up, we're going to build a battery plant, or we're going to build a semiconductor plant like we're going to do in Phoenix, all of a sudden the people who are there that are, that are looking for jobs and may have worked in another sector are not trained in that location to do that right. thing. And so we have to really work hard to make sure that this ubiquitous problem, which is a national problem that requires federal input, but not just a federal solution, that we actually build the workforce, but you gotta have the people. Then you gotta line them up with the job, and then you have to create the training right. mechanism. The second issue, I think, is permitting. 95% um, of these projects don't really require extensive permits, about 5% of them do. These are really the big, big ones, and we have to get better at, at get, getting permitting done faster so that we can move this money out right to get it where it needs to be. And the third problem would be technical assistance to small communities so that they can apply for these grants in order to make sure that those people who have been left behind actually have a right. fair shot and don't just get run over by the big cities and big states that actually happen to have all the intellectual okay. We're grants. out of time. Final question. Would you ever consider running for President of the United States? Not at this time. Not at this time. <laughs> but at some time. Not at this time. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm for, I'm for Joe Biden. He's gonna, and if somebody, he's going to run again and he's going to win again, by the way. If somebody here has a... And I'm for him, a thousand percent. I love somebody it. somybody here has an infrastructure project they want to get funded, should they just call you They should directly? call you, and then you should call me. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. <laughs> Thank you. See you.